Long Guns describes itself as a nihilistic action platforming roguelite and originally released in 2017 for home computers. It has just released on the Nintendo Switch by way of a doppelganger edition which includes a few new modes. The cryptic tagline for the game is that it is a riddle that demands sacrifice, but is it worth playing or is the only sacrifice you'll be making that of your precious time and money? Well I'm Glenn Bolger, thank you to the publishing team for the review code and now let's find out. Now as I alluded to in that opening by giving you the game's tagline, it's a riddle that demands sacrifice, it's apparent that a big part of this game's premise is a very deliberate play by way of the developers to make this as obscure an experience as possible, and that includes the story which I will not go into at all in this review. A large part of it is for the player to figure out certain mechanics for themselves, and for this reason I'm going to put a timestamp in the description of this review that will bypass the gameplay and control section, bringing those who want to play the game with the developer's intentions intact back just in time for us to wrap up gameplay and move on to visuals and audio. For those that stay I am going to go into those game mechanics in detail, as I feel that without that a lot of people may become frustrated and feel they've wasted their money here without ever really scratching the surface. So final warning. Okay, let's go. So for those still here then, I'm going to go through those core mechanics. As I said, the game is an action platformer with roguelite elements, and basically every time you shoot your weapon, you will score points that are shown down at the bottom of the screen. This is actually your currency, and killing enemies will boost it further. Killing enemies consecutively will build a combo meter, multiplying the points you get added to your total, and this is essential if you want to amass the sort of currency that you need to get far into the game. You see this currency can be spent on weapons, new skulls to wear which grant powers, or upgrade cards which will boost the stats of your character. The weapons are fairly self-explanatory, you'll find shotguns, rocket launchers, or standard pistols, each with their own finite amount of ammo before they run out, but the other power-ups are not quite as clear. The skulls will all grant you some sort of power, whereas the other cards, as far as I could see, are all for passive abilities, and you may need a good few cards of the same nature, say speed, health, weapon power, etc., to actually grow your base stats to a point where it's noticeable, and this is all shown in the menu screen. The aforementioned cards are generally found in a shop located somewhere in each run, and this shop is displayed on your map but there is also a treasure chest found somewhere on each floor which will contain a stronger card than usual. Standard treasure chests can also be found scattered about the dungeon, although these will require a small percentage of your health to be sacrificed in order to open them up, adding that risk and reward element to proceedings. Each floor has a boss battle and victory here will see you move on. Death though will see you lose absolutely everything, your cards, weapons and all of your currency. There are ways to circumnavigate this, at least to an extent, but again, none of this really is explained. In certain rooms within the dungeons you will notice windows. Jumping towards these and pressing X will actually allow you to leave the dungeon, having your health fully restored and keeping all items in the process, but at the expense of losing all progress in that run in terms of how far into the dungeon you got. The dungeons are procedurally generated and you will be presented with a new layout each time, so it's only really worth using this if you are on the verge of death or you are farming for cards before embarking on a serious run later on. Now you can actually store your cards and you will then keep them in the event of death, but obviously you won't benefit from their abilities in the meantime, and you do this by putting them into the crypt outside of the dungeon. Cards actually have a time limit before you lose them anyway, and if they are about to disappear, you can consume them by holding down the A button over the card in the options menu, and you will receive a small health boost for your troubles. You can put your points into increasing the power of weapons at this station here, and this does stack between runs. The final mechanic I will touch on is that of the followers. You may well find these trapped in cages as you make your way through the dungeon, and by releasing them, the adulation they will give you in return will boost the currency number at the bottom, and it does this by way of a constant increment of 1 per follower. This introduces almost a clicker gameplay aspect to proceedings, and rescuing lots of them, of course, will make the grind of building currency much easier, and you do retain these followers from one run to the next. The combat itself feels very satisfying, and it certainly presents a major challenge. You have a few moves such as rolls and dashes that you can combine together to help you defeat the enemy, whilst also attempting to keep that combo meter ticking along. The procedural generation keeps things interesting, although because it works via set rooms being slotted together in a different order each time, you will see the same rooms quite often, with the same enemies in the same place, so whilst it is procedurally generated, there is still quite a lot of repetition. 
I do feel that the game brings some very interesting ideas to the roguelite table, but apart from a set of basic pictures, giving you a very vague idea of what it's all about, none of it is really explained properly, and whilst in terms of some of the mechanics I don't mind this, as it all starts to become apparent through a number of runs anyway, I do think it really hurts the game when it comes to that card power-up system. After a few hours of play, I still didn't fully understand it, and you potentially need so many of a certain card type to see any real progress, at least until you start unlocking higher ranked cards, and I do feel that this part of the game either needed explaining fully, or simplifying down to obvious power-ups and perks being awarded. Even things like the card storage system are so obtuse. I like the vague nature to a point, but I think it will put a lot of people off, which is a shame, because the game underneath it is very good fun. Right, welcome back to everyone who skipped ahead, as we're going to have a quick look at what's new for this doppelganger edition before wrapping gameplay up. So this time round you can play the game locally in two player co-op, plus an arena mode has been added where you kill as many enemies as you can in waves before you die yourself. Gameplay has much more depth to it than you would initially realise, and is definitely a lot of fun, albeit very difficult. It will take time and patience to get the most out of, but for me though some of the mechanics are just too obtuse for their own good, and it is to the detriment of the game to a small extent. Gameplay gets 15 out of 20. Controls also take some getting used to, and you will need to become well acquainted with rolling jumps and dashes if you want to make real progress, and they also score 15 out of 20. In terms of the visuals, well, as you've seen, the game adopts a monochromatic style with the world built using black and white and just a hint of red. Stylistically, this looks great. It creates a sense of foreboding and sets the dark and macabre scene that the game is striving for very well. The enemies are morbid and creepy, with body parts such as fingers and legs joining the host of monsters on show. On the more negative side, there were a few times where the lack of colour and simplistic graphics meant I was killed without ever really knowing how or why, as it was hard to see some details. The style is carried over into menus which makes them quite difficult to navigate early on and it's another reason why the card power up system feels so vague. Performance wise the game does experience some serious slowdown when there are a lot of enemies in one room at a time, especially enemies that fire projectiles and at these times the frame rate does tank quite significantly. When it comes to playing in handheld mode, well, it's a very similar story to that of Dot. As mentioned, the game is light on explanation, so there isn't really much text to read, and performance is largely the same, for better or worse. Audio-wise, some of the music is very atmospheric and reminded me in some respects to the score used in The Binding of Isaac, whilst at other times there is no music at all, which to be honest is a little jarring. Visuals look great from a stylistic viewpoint, although it can cause issues from a more practical angle at times, plus performance does suffer on occasion, and they score 15 out of 20. Audio is very good, but perhaps a little inconsistent, and it scores 16 out of 20. Non-Guns Doppelganger Edition costs £13.49, and regional equivalents are on your screen now. Now this is a very difficult section to score. This game will last some people hours and hours as they try to improve their runs and defeat all of the bosses of course, whereas other people may be put off by how unforgiving and vague everything is and feel like they've wasted their money. I would say that if you watch the gameplay section in full and you are on board with the mechanics, or you love the thought of getting destroyed initially as you begin to piece it all together for yourself, then you will definitely get your money's worth, especially if you have someone locally to play with. With that mindset, value scores 16 out of 20. To conclude, Non Guns Doppelganger Edition can definitely rub shoulders with some of the best roguelites once you get into it. The risk of death and losing progress is always there, but there are also ways to make some permanent or semi-permanent progression to make it all feel worth it. It is, however, shrouded in such an enigmatic blanket that some may never get far enough to experience it. Now, I'm all for finding things out for myself, but I do feel that some bits here, especially that card system, are just too vague, and had they made this part a little more clear and concise, then this would be well up there competing with the best games in the genre as far as I'm concerned. As it is, it's still a very good game, it just falls short of greatness. Non Guns Doppelganger Edition gets a switch up score of 77%. Thank you everybody for watching that review, I hope you enjoyed it, please do remember to leave a like if you did. A thank you to Rob, one of our writers who also played this game and just gave me some of his thoughts and opinions as I put this review together. A thank you to our Patreons as always for your continued support and to each and every one of you for watching our videos. Take care, stay safe of course and until next time, happy gaming.